Thank you all so much for coming out this afternoon to to learn about the Shroud of Turin and to learn more about our Lord Jesus Christ as we ponder his passion. This presentation really has two parts. So the first part will be a look at the science and the history of the Shroud. And so during this first part of the presentation, I'm only going to be talking about information that is widely agreed upon by scientists and historians. So if I'm talking about something that is a theory, I'll be careful to point that out to you that it's a theory and it requires further study. And if it's um, the second part of the presentation, we will be switching gears completely. And instead of talking about the man of the shroud, we'll be talking about the wounds of Jesus as they're reflected on the shroud. So we'll, we'll have two different parts to the presentation. I welcome questions, but I ask that you please wait until the end and we'll leave time for a Q&A section. So this generates a lot of questions and so I'll try to cover as much information as I can, but we'll address the questions at the end. So in order to begin, I just wanna orient you to the shroud. So I've got some volunteers that are helping me and the reason why I like to start this way is because sometimes people have a hard time visualizing how the image is on the shroud. So I've asked uh, my friends to help me with this and they're going to first show you how large the fabric is. People are often very surprised by the size of the fabric. It's over 14 feet long and three and a half feet wide. And so Raina has agreed to be wrapped up in this so you can get an idea. <laughs> so uh, Raina, if you'll just put your heels down toward Nancy and just lay down face up. Uh, so Raina, you're gonna have to scoot up more. <laughs> uh, okay, they'll get the idea. Okay. All right. Thank you, ladies. Okay, so what they are, what you can see, and I hope everyone can see it, is that the shroud came on the back of the body and then came over the top side and was draped over the, the body of the man of the shroud. And so I want you to notice a couple things. Genevieve, if you could please point out the tip of Raina's nose. And can you see her fingers through the fabric of the shroud? You can see how the fabric drapes over her and you can see the shape of her body under there. You can see her, her feet really well at the, at the end. And I just want you to visualize that the, the image is a head to head image on the inside of the cloth. So thank you all for, for demonstrating that for us. Okay. Next slide. <laughs> okay. I don't know if it's possible to turn the lights down a little, Scotty. It's hard to see the screen. It's more important to see the screen than to see me. <laughs> so, a little more, please. Yeah, thank you. And while he's adjusting the lights, I want you to notice these ladies are over here folding up the shroud. And this is an important piece of information because the shroud was folded and stored at, in various different ways during its history. And so that folding included information about where the shroud was during its history. How's that? Can you see it better now? Okay, great. All right, so what I want you to notice is that when they're folding the shroud over, it's sort of like, uh, at Christmas time, if you take some paper and fold it up and then you cut out a snowflake. So when you open it up, the, the hole goes all the way through the, the paper. That's what happened at one point in the history of the shroud. It had a burn and we're gonna talk more about that, but I just wanted you to kind of have a visual image of the fabric being folded up and then how a burn could penetrate through and be reflected throughout the entire fabric. So what we're gonna start with, I wanna orient you to what you're looking at. So this is what the shroud looks like today. This is the, 
the face of the man of the shroud here, and you can see the bloody arms here, a large wound at the wrist, and some bloody feet here. And then this is the back of the head. So it's a head-to-head -head image. This is the back side. There's a large blood stain at the nape of the neck, very bloody back, a large blood stain across the small of the back, and a very bloody footprint. So I wanted you to get an, uh, the sense of what the fabric looks like. And you can see this close up of the fabric itself. It's a beautiful fabric. It's a three to one herringbone weave. There is no other fabric that has been discovered that is a linen fabric that is a three to one weave like this from the ancient times. There have been some fabrics in wool or cotton discovered, but not in this linen. And this linen was a precious object. It was valued like gold or silver. And you can see that even to this day, it maintains its beauty. It's a, a lovely fabric. So I just want to continue orienting you to what you're seeing. So these are the, the markings on the shroud. We've already talked about this very faint image of a scourged and crucified man. But the other things you see are these burn marks that we talked about. And that was from a fire that occurred in 1532. And the shroud was stored in a silver reliquary box over the altar of a chapel in France. And the chapel had a fire and the heat of the fire was so intense that it caused the silver to melt. And the melting point of silver is 1,732 degrees. So this was an intensely hot fire. However, the image of the shroud was preserved, even in the midst of this terrible fire that it endured. The other things that you see, so the, the fire burned all the way through, and then there were patches applied by the poor Claire nuns to protect the shroud. And in 1534, the nuns also applied a backing cloth to strengthen the cloth. And so for over 500 years, that backing cloth was in place and nobody saw the other side of the shroud for that period of time. There's also water stains very evident on the shroud. There's a big one here at the abdomen and there's one here around the knees on the front. And that gives some information about how the shroud might have been stored at various times in its history. And then there's the blood. And we're going to spend more time talking about the blood, but the blood is one of the most vivid images that you will see on the cloth. And then we'll spend a lot of time talking about the image. Okay. Let's see if this is working. There we go. All right. So we're going to start by talking about the image. So this image, this faint image of a man who has been crowned with thorns, scourged, crucified and pierced in the side. All of these wounds are evident on this cloth. But the image itself is very mysterious. The image is only 15% darker than the background of the linen cloth itself. And it's very superficial. So in this slide, you can see that each thread, each thread is made up of fibrils. So each thread has between 70 and 120 fibrils. So within a thread, only one or two of the fibrils have the image, the, the darkened area of the image, and the rest of the thread is not discolored. So the image is extremely superficial. In fact, if you took a razor blade and ran it across the surface of the image, you would completely scrape the image off. So the image does not penetrate through the fabric. If you were to shine a light through the fabric from the back, the fabric would dis the image would disappear. So it's only on the most superficial area of the cloth. Let's see. So this is a slide to show you just how superficial that image area is. It's only on the surface of the threads. It does not penetrate the cell wall of the fibers, the organic flax fibers that make up the linen. So the next thing we wanna talk about is the blood that's on the shroud. Now the blood stains are still a vivid red. They soak through the fabric of the shroud. So if you look at the other side of the shroud, you will see the blood stains. And a very curious thing is that the blood stains were on the fabric before the image. So if you scrape away the blood, 
There's no image area underneath the blood. The blood was there first. The blood has been studied, and there have been conclusions that have made, and as recently as 2017, new information has come out about the blood. So the, the blood has been proven to be of a male, human, and it's a type AB blood, and it, it has high levels of creatinine in the blood. And this is a substance that occurs when the person who's bleeding has been subjected to high degrees of stress and torture. And this was an important component of the blood. And it's thought that the, this creatinine and then also the presence of bilirubin is what has led to the, the blood having its bright red color even after all of this time. Because as you all know, if you have blood on a, a white, piece of fabric, over time, that blood starts to discolor and turn a dark brown or even a black. But the blood on the shroud can, maintains its bright red color even to this day. So what about the man of the shroud? So scientists have studied, scientists and also forensic doctors and artists have studied the shroud to get a picture of what the man of the shroud looks like or his physical characteristics. And so they've determined that he was about 5'10 to 6 feet tall, around 170 to 180 pounds with a muscular, very fit physique. And he has features of a person from the, the Middle East or Aramaic features. So the almond shaped eyes, the long nose, and then his hairstyle, the, the locks in front and the unbound ponytail at the back of his head. And I've read some Jewish scholars who say that this unbound ponytail is the most Jewish feature of the man of the shroud. And this is the hairstyle that we see even some Jewish men still wear to this day. The body that is wrapped in the shroud maintained rigor mortis and rigor mortis kept the shape of the body and it sets in within two hours after death and then lasts up to about 36 hours. So the body is in rigor mortis when the image is made. So the history of the shroud is something that's gotten a lot of attention, raised a lot of questions. And so for the purpose of this presentation, I'm only going to focus on the history of the shroud since it showed up in recorded history, which was in 1353. There are theories about where the shroud was in the, the time before 1353. And if you want to talk about that during the Q&A time, we can. But for this part of the presentation, we're going to talk about things that are widely agreed upon by scientists and historians. So the shroud shows up for the first time up in Northern France in this little town of Lire, and it's being put on display for pilgrims to come and to view the shroud. And it comes to the attention of the local bishop that the owners of the shroud are displaying it and they're having a lot of pilgrims come to see it. And so this starts to raise some questions. Well, how did this family in Lire, France, come to own the, this important relic? And they could never answer that question. They could never say or they wouldn't say how they came to own this shroud. So a couple of generations later, uh, the, a descendant of that family was looking for a way to secure the future of the shroud, and she approached the ruling family of that area, the Savoy family, and the Savoys were the ruling house in that area of oh, went too far. Northern, northern Italy and southern France. So the house of Savoy was uh, looking for a way to substantiate their, their dynasty. And so having an important relic was a good way for them to show their authority that they had been appointed by God to have this ruling position. So they were looking for a dynastic relic. And this relative that had inherited the shroud, Margaret de Charny, approached them. And so they made a, a transaction for two castles in exchange for the shroud itself. So that was in 1453 the Savoy family took ownership of the shroud. And they, they owned the shroud all the way from 1453 until 1983. Yeah, so people are often surprised by that because the shroud was in private ownership all the way up until 1983. 
So the Savoy family traveled around from castle to castle. And for the first 50 years they owned the shroud, they carried it around with them. But then they decided that they needed a home, a permanent home for the shroud. So they built their palace and adjacent to their palace, they built the Cathedral of St. John the Baptist in Turin, Italy. So this is the combination of the dynastic power and the religious power in one spot. And so that is where they, they built a chapel to house the Shroud of Turin. And that's when it, it got its name, the Shroud of Turin. Before that, it was called the Holy Cloth or the Holy Shroud. But since 1578, it's been in residence in Turin, Italy, and that's been its name. So in 1898, the Savoy family wanted to celebrate 400 years of their family being in, in Turin, Italy. And so they decided to have an exhibition of the shroud, and they hired an amateur photographer by the name of Secunda Pia to come and photograph the shroud for the first time. So the photography had just started to become popularized in the 1840s, so it's still a really new technology. And so they found this, this amateur photographer to come and he had his big, his big camera here. And then he had large glass plates that he put in the developing solution in order to develop the image. And so when he went into his dark room to develop the image of the face of the man of the shroud, this is what he saw. And in his memoirs, Secunda Pia said that as he saw this ghostly face starting to emerge out of his chemicals in his dark room, that he nearly dropped the glass plate because he realized that for the first, he was the first person to see the face of Jesus in almost 2,000 years. But there were a lot of people who thought that somehow Secunda Pia manipulated this image and that he somehow fraudulently produced this image. So it was photographed again in 1932. And in his memoir, Secunda Pia wrote that he was the most relieved person in the world when the, the professional French photographer got the same results that he did. So the, the conclusion you can draw from looking at this photographic negative of the man of the shroud is that the, the image that you see with the naked eye is itself a negative image. So when you look at the negative photograph, it becomes a positive image. And of course, this was absolutely amazing to, to scientists, to anyone who saw this photographic negative. They realized there was so much more information that was available to the naked eye when you looked at that photographic negative. And this is what started the, the modern exploration, the modern scientific exploration of the shroud. And this set off a firestorm of people wanting to understand this very mysterious image. So just a couple of things that, oh, I forgot I put that in there. <laughs> this is obviously me. Uh, Genevieve Keeney and I were at the Museum of the Bible this past weekend, and we'll be telling you more about that, but they opened up a temporary exhibit on the Shroud of Turin, and they had a selfie station there. And they're the purpose of their selfie station is to try to under explain this idea of photographic negativity because there's a whole generation of people who've never seen a film negative. And so it's hard for them to understand. And then the other thing is that they're tying in this idea of the, the selfie station with the idea that the Shroud of Turin was the first selfie. So, <laughs> so I forgot I put this in, but this is to illustrate the obviously what you see on this side is what you see with the naked eye and the photographic negative is the reverse image of that. All right, so back to science. The, this discovery of this characteristic of the shroud caused a lot of people to become interested in the shroud. So one of the first books that was published about the anatomy of the man and the physiology of crucifixion was by a French physician by the name of Pierre Barbet. And he wrote this book, A Doctor at Calvary, and he concluded that the man of the shroud is anatomically perfect. And he wanted to understand more about the mechanism of crucifixion. And so he actually started crucifying cadavers to understand how the weight of the human body could be supported on a cross. So his, his research was foundational to understanding some of the later things for shroud studies. 
And then in 1973, Max Fry, who was a Swiss criminologist, he had pioneered the use of sticky tape. And so he was allowed the opportunity to do some sticky tape sampling on the shroud itself. And what he discovered was pollen and dust that was trapped in the fibers of the shroud. And so that was able to be studied under the microscope to understand more about the history of the shroud, where it had been before the 1350s when it showed up in France. And what he discovered was that there were 22 pollen species for plants that were unique to areas around Constantinople and modern day Turkey. And then there were seven pollen species from plants most common to the Middle East. And then a very interesting thing is that he found dust and dirt within the fibers of the shroud. And that has been traced to travertine aragonite that occurs only in the tombs around Jerusalem. So this was confirmation of the the trail, the historical trail that the shroud had traveled. So the next thing that happened in the history, the scientific history of the shroud is that there were some Air Force captains who were stationed in Los Alamos, New Mexico, and they had access to a sophisticated image enhancer called a VPA image analyzer. And it had been designed to, for the space program, this image analyzer, to give topographical information from the light and dark areas of photographs that were being sent back from the space program. And so they had this idea that they would put a photograph of the shroud into this VP8 image analyzer and just see what happened. And they were absolutely astonished when they saw this three-dimensional information was stored within this linen fabric. So what they found out is that there is a relationship between the distance of the cloth from the body of the person it wrapped and the density of the image on the shroud. So that's why I pointed out to you when we wrapped Raina that you could see her nose on the shroud uh, through the fabric and you could see her fingers and you could see her feet very well. So those were areas where the fabric wrapped around her, touched her skin. So in the image area, those areas are darker, but they're only darker because there are more fibrils that are colored. They're, the image density is the same across the shroud on the front image and on the back image. So even the pressure of the man's body pressing down didn't change the, the density of the image. The only reason why it's darker in some of those areas is because more fibrils are covered, colored. And that is related to the distance from the body to the cloth. And a, they discovered that even though there are areas on the shroud where the cloth does not touch the body, there's still image area there. So it's not a, related to contact with the body. The image isn't caused by contact. There's some other mechanism going on. So these Air Force captains were very intrigued by this image, that it had the photographic negativity and the three-dimensional information. So they put together a plan and a team, which was known as the Shroud of Turin Research Project Team. And so this was in 1978. They put together a team of 26 scientists who went to Turin. And then there were multiple scientists who, in addition to that, who studied the information after their, their time in Turin. They had this group of scientists who had access to the shroud for five full days, over 120 hours. And they used that time completely with scientific exper experiments that they had planned in advance. They also brought with them tons of the most up-to-date scientific equipment that they could use, which would not in any way damage or hurt the shroud. And so this was known as the Shroud of Turin Research Project Team. And a question I always get in, in these talks is what made me interested in the shroud? And as Raina said, I've been interested in the shroud since I was a teenager because a member of my church, this man right here, Rudy Dictal, was a member of the STIRP team. And so Rudy was in charge of setting up all of the equipment. And when he came back from his time in Turin, he would give lectures all around town. And every time Rudy gave a lecture, I would go. And my dad and I were just absolutely fascinated with the shroud. And so we had the opportunity to learn directly from Rudy about his experience with the shroud. 
So I, I left this picture in here because it shows you the conditions that they were working in. They, the room that was set up for them to study the shroud was in the palace. So you can see it's not a scientific laboratory. It's a beautiful room, but probably not the best place for scientific experiments. But they were well prepared and they were able to conduct multiple, multiple experiments. This is just a, a short list of some of the experiments that they conducted during their five days with the shroud. The objective of the STIRP team, they had one objective, and that was to understand how the image was formed. And they were doing all these tests to understand the mechanism for image formation. So after five days of tests, they came back, they analyzed their data, and after four years, they published 20 peer-reviewed scientific journal articles with their results. And I just want to read to you the conclusion of their findings, which were published in 1988. We can conclude for now that the shroud image is that of a real human form of a scourged, crucified man. It is not the product of an artist. The blood stains are composed of hemoglobin and also give a positive test for serum albumin. The image is an ongoing mystery, and until further chemical studies are made, perhaps by this group of scientists or some other scientists in the future, the problem remains unsolved. So what they found is that there's no paint, no pigments, no brush strokes, no dyes. There's nothing on the shroud that could have been completed by an artist. The image is unbounded and it just simply fades away into the fabric. You might also notice that on, on a replica of the shroud, when you're able to get up close to it, you almost can't even see the image. It's, you have to step away 10 or 15 feet to have the image be clear to you. So as I already mentioned, in 1983, the shroud was deeded to the Holy See. So it was owned up till that time by King Umberto, who was the last king of Italy. He was the deposed king during World War II. And when he died, he left the shroud in his will to the Holy See. So the current Pope is the actual owner of the shroud. So in 1988, a team of scientists put together a request to have the radiocarbon dating done of the shroud. And so the Holy See agreed to have this take place. So this is the area right here that was radiocarbon dated. And I have this slide in here so that you can see what might be actually the worst possible place on the shroud to select the fabric from for the radiocarbon dating. The protocol for radiocarbon dating is to select samples from various locations around the shroud, but the, the team that did the radiocarbon dating did not follow that protocol. They selected one place, this very heavily handled area right down here. And this, they cut out this small piece for the radiocarbon dating. They cut one piece and they divided it into four samples. One sample went to Oxford, one to Zurich, one to Arizona, and then one was kept in reserve because in radiocarbon dating, the samples are completely destroyed. So then they kept a sample in reserve. So some of you may remember this outcome of this radiocarbon dating in 1988. The results of that were that the shroud was dated between the years of 1260 and 1390. And you might recall that when we said that it first showed up in history was in, in the 1350s, which is right in the middle of this date range. So this led people to draw the conclusion that the shroud is a fake. And I remember vividly in 1988 when these headlines came out, it was just a dark day. And it was kind of a crushing feeling that how could this, this be a uh, fake? And so in the world of shroud studies, it kind of went quiet for a while. People were disheartened, but in the background, people continued to do their research. And scientists continued to ask the question. Now they had two questions. How was the image formed? And why was this radiocarbon dating so different than what they had expected? So there's two current theories, and I'm going to emphasize again, these are theories about how the, the radiocarbon dating was skewed. One theory is that there was a medieval reweave. So that area I showed you had been handled in the past, and it was near an area that 
that scientists knew had been repaired in the past. And so there was a theory that emerged in the early 2000s that the area that was radiocarbon dated had been mended using an invisible reweave that was known in France in the Middle Ages. So that's one thought about it. And then another thought, this just came out in a book in 2017, and, and they use multiple alternative dating methods other than radiocarbon dating to identify the age of the shroud. And so their results were using the multiple, multiple scientific studies. Their date range was 280 BC to 220 AD. And obviously the death of Christ is right in the middle of that time. So further investigation on those theories about why the radiocarbon dating turned out the way it did. The next significant thing that happened in the history of the shroud was that it was restored in 2002. So you'll see this top image is enhanced so that you can really get a picture of the image of the man of the shroud. And that's before the restorations. During the restorations, they removed those patches that had been put on in 1534. They cut off some of the area that had been singed because it was starting to damage the surrounding linen. And then they removed the holland cloth, the backing cloth that had been applied. And they put a new backing cloth on that was lighter. So the result of that is that the image is a little bit harder to see now because there's less contrast. But those old patches have been removed and so the shroud can really be seen in all of its beauty today. So this is where the shroud is stored today. It's not on display. It's theoretically put on display four times a century, although there's been a little cheating recently because it was put on display in 2010 for Pope Benedict and 2015 for Pope Francis. And the next scheduled time it should be put on display is 2025. So it's in this cathedral, in this chapel, but it's stored behind the scenes in a bulletproof glass case. It's stored flat and there's argon gas in pumped into the case to keep it at a constant temperature and a constant air, air circulating. So the shroud is the single most studied item in the history of the world. It's been more scientifically studied than any other item, not just religious item, but scientific items as well. And it has spawned a whole new field of study, which is known as syndology. And syndologists can be from all kinds of walks of life, chemists, physicists, physicists, artists, um, botanists. There are so many fields of study that are related to looking at and understanding this, the shroud. So what does the church say about the shroud? I like this quote from Pope St. John Paul II because he really answers that question with a lot of clarity. In 1998, he visited the shroud and he said, since it is not a matter of faith, the church has no specific competence to pronounce on these questions. She entrusts to scientists the task of continuing to investigate so that satisfactory answers may be found to the questions connected with this sheet. So the conclusion is that there's further study to be made and that there are still questions remaining about how the image was formed and about the, the radiocarbon dating. Scientists agree that the man of the shroud is a representation of Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus of Nazareth and the man of the shroud are the only people in history who had the wounds that are reflected here. The, the crowning of thorns, the crucifixion, the uh, spear wound, and the scourging. And so our understanding of the shroud is a matter of faith. What we believe in it is is up to us in terms of our faith, but it is a tool that can help us to understand our faith a little better. And so that's gonna be the topic of the next part of the presentation. But when I was a little girl, I used to always see this image of the stone being rolled away from the tomb. And I always thought it was so that Jesus could get out. <laughs> but what I realized is that the king of kings and the creator of the universe did not need the stone rolled away so that he could get out. 
the stone was rolled away so that we could look inside and we could see that Jesus is not there. He rose from the dead just as he said he would. So the focus of the second half of this presentation is on the love of God for us and how that love is shown by what Jesus suffered for us. And I want you to keep in the back of your head that famous scripture from John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So that's really the theme of the second part of this presentation. And I'm just going to add to that this quote that I love from St. Catherine of Siena. She said, nails were not enough to hold God and man nailed and fastened on the cross, had not love held him there first. So we're going to be talking about what led up to this uh, death and resurrection of Jesus. But we're going to begin at the end with the empty tomb. But it wasn't completely empty. So the scriptures from John chapter 20 tell us that it was early on the first day of the week, and it was still dark, and Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. So she went running to Simon Peter and to John, and she said, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and, and we don't know where they put him. So Peter and John started running, and when they got there, John got there first, and he bent down, and he looked in, and the scriptures tell us he saw the strips of linen lying there, but he did not go in. But then Peter came running up, and Peter saw, he went right into the tomb, and he also saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. So finally, John went inside, and he looked around, and the scriptures tell us that he saw and he believed. So there was something very, very significant about what John saw when he went into that tomb that convinced him that everything Jesus had told him was real. So my purpose today in this part of the talk is to talk about how the shroud is, can be considered the fifth gospel. And what I mean by that is it has so much information in it that helps us have a better understanding of what is recorded in the first four gospels. And the shroud tells us what Jesus suffered more than even the gospels themselves, but it doesn't tell us why. So we have to use this, the shroud in conjunction with the scriptures to understand the theological significance of what Jesus suffered. And as Father Ben started, stated at the beginning, that during the season of Lent, it's a good time for us to slow down and to really focus on, on Jesus and his love and his sacrifice for us. So I'm going to do a quick history lesson here. Jesus was coming into Jerusalem because he was a faithful Jewish man. And the Jewish men had three pilgrimage feasts every year where they came into Jerusalem and they made sacrifices at the temple. And so Jesus was coming to commemorate the Passover. So you'll remember when the Israelites were enslaved in Egypt, they kept petitioning Pharaoh to let them go. And Pharaoh kept saying no. And then there were the series of 10 plagues. And the plagues got increasingly more and more difficult for the people to bear. The ninth plague was a darkness that covered the land, and it was a darkness so deep that you could feel it. And then the tenth plague was that the angel of death would come and would kill the firstborn of every family. And the protection from that angel of death was to sacrifice a perfect lamb and to take the blood of that lamb and to mark their doors and lintels over their doors with the blood of that perfect lamb. So that is the feast of Passover that Jesus was celebrating. And that was this tremendous event in the history of the Jewish people. And it was commemorated by hundreds of thousands of pilgrims coming into the temple. And that's what you see here, the temple in Jerusalem, all the pilgrims coming in to offer their sacrifices for Passover. And that's why Jesus was in Jerusalem. And we know that Jesus had his final meal with his friends, and this is what we call today the Last Supper, and he instituted the Eucharist during that, 
that final meal. And then he left from the meal and went out to the Garden of Gethsemane. And that's where his passion begins. And we know from the sorrowful mysteries of the rosary, the first sorrowful mystery is the agony in the garden. And Jesus is praying passionately about undertaking the will of the Father. And as he's there praying, Judas comes with the army from the temple. The Jewish guards are coming out to arrest Jesus because the Jewish leaders have sent them. And they come to Jesus and they take him away in chains and they take him before the Sanhedrin. And so the Sanhedrin is kind of the ruling group of uh, Pharisees and Sadducees and leaders in the Jewish community. And they bring Jesus before Caiaphas and they're trying to find two witnesses that will condemn Jesus because they want Jesus to be put to death. And so they're asking different people to testify against Jesus, but they can never find two witnesses that exactly agree. So finally, Caiaphas, the high priest, he asked Jesus directly, who, who do you say that you are? And Jesus answers him. He says, Caiaphas asked him, are you the Messiah, the son of God? And Jesus answered, you have said so. But I say to all of you, from now on, you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the mighty one and coming on the clouds of heaven. And Caiaphas and all the Jewish leaders recognized that Jesus was saying that he was the son of God and he was the Messiah. And at that moment, Caiaphas rips his garments and accuses Jesus of blasphemy. So according to the Jewish law, blasphemy was grounds for execution. But the Jewish people did not have any authority to execute one of their citizens. They had to go to the Roman authority. And also the punishment for blasphemy in the Jewish law was stoning. And we know from the scriptures that Jesus had repeatedly said that he would be crucified. So when Jesus is before, um, before they turn Jesus over to Pilate, the Jewish temple guards in the presence of the high priests and the leaders, they mock Jesus and they beat him in the face. And they, they yell at him, prophesy. And this is the, one of the first injuries that we see on the shroud. And for the rest of the presentation, I'm going to be using the sculpture that was developed using the shroud as the model. And it's very graphic, and it shows the wounds very vividly. And so this is a close-up of the face of the sculpture. And this goes in accordance with what the Jewish leaders did to Jesus, that they, uh, they struck him with a rod in his face and they beat him and they spit at him. And so on this image of the, the man of the shroud, you can see that his nose is clearly broken, his eye is swollen, and his cheekbone is also swollen. And I just want to pause here for a minute because this is one of the, the most memorable stories that I remember from Rudy, the man that I knew who was on the STIRP team. He said that there were, there were a wide variety of scientists on that team, and they ranged from Catholics to Protestants to agnostics to Jews to even some atheists. So all scientists, but all kinds of religious backgrounds. And Rudy told the story about one of the scientists who was a skeptic about the authenticity of the shroud. And he found himself alone for a few minutes one evening in front of the face of the man of the shroud. And he was looking at that wounded face and looking at that broken nose. And he said, well, aha, this cannot be the Messiah because the sacrificial lamb had to be perfect. None of his bones could be broken. And Rudy said that that man sat there and then he realized that the nose is cartilage. And so even though the nose is broken, it wasn't in violation of the prophecy that none of his bones shall be broken. So the next part of Jesus' journey is that he's sent from the Jewish leaders and the high priest Caiaphas over to Pilate. And Pilate does not care if Jesus claims to be the king of the Jews or the king of kings, that isn't important to him. So instead, the Jewish leaders manufacture a claim that Jesus is an insurrectionist. They say that he is trying to lead people to, to revolt against Rome and against Caesar, because this is, an, it is a crime punishable by execution, by crucifixion. 
So Jesus comes before Pilate and Pilate says repeatedly, I find no fault with this man. And yet they keep saying, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And in the language of the time, the way that you emphasize something isn't saying more, most, you said, you said the word over and over again. And we see this in mass when we say, holy, 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 that's emphasizing this idea that, that God is the most holy. And that's what we see here with Pilate. He says three times, I find no fault with this man. And yet the people keep crying out for Jesus to be crucified. So, <clears throat> excuse me, Pilate is looking for a way to get Jesus out of this position. <clears throat> so he sends him over to Herod. Now, Herod is the, the ancestral king of the Jews. His father, Herod the Great, was the king of the Jews at the time when Jesus was born. And you'll remember him from the story of the murder of the innocents in Bethlehem. So this is his son, and he is from the area of northern Judea, which is the home of Jesus. So Pilate hears Herod's in town. So he says, I'm going to let Herod deal with him, and this will be his problem. And this is this Herod is a very morally corrupt individual. He's the one who had John the Baptist beheaded. So that's who Jesus goes in front of. And Herod is very eager to see Jesus because he had heard about the signs and wonders that Jesus had been performing. And he wanted Jesus to perform a miracle. But yet Jesus stood before him in fulfillment of Isaiah, where Isaiah 53 said, he stands there silent like a lamb or like a sheep before the shears. So he opened not his mouth. So Herod doesn't get any satisfaction from Jesus. So they mock him and then they send him back to Pilate. <clears throat> so Pilate's getting a little bit desperate here because he doesn't want to execute Jesus. So he has another idea, which is he'll re he'll ask the people if he want, they want him to release uh, one of the incarcerated people because of the season of Passover. And so he has the known murderer and insurrectionist Barabbas, and he has Jesus, and he offers them one of these two men. And the irony here is that Barabbas means son of the father, Bar Abba. And so we have this counterfeit son of the father, Barabbas, and we have the true son of the father standing before the people, and yet they call out for, for Barabbas to be released. So Pilate has one more option. And his option is to have Jesus scourged. Now, scourging, had there were three options with scourging. One is that it could be a punishment all on its own. And so the legionaries would scourge someone within an inch of their lives, but they would not kill them. So that was one option. The second option is for them to scourge them actually to death because scourging could be so torturous that the person could actually die. And then the third option was for the scourging to be combined with crucifixion. And in the case of Jesus, he is sentenced to scourging, and then he is later sentenced to die. So the scourging that Jesus endured was especially brutal because it was the first type of scourging, to be scourged within, in, within an inch of his life. So we're going to talk about the scourging. And the shroud gives us a great deal of information about the scourging and what Jesus endured. And the gospels actually tell us very little. It says in the gospel of John, then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And in the gospel of Matthew, it says, then he released Barabbas for them. But after having Jesus scourged, he handed him over to be crucified. But the shroud of Turin gives us a lot of information about what Jesus endured in the scourging. A lot of times when we see Jesus uh, on the cross or, or being scourged, he's draped with a modesty cloth. But the reality was that he, he was stripped naked. And this was part of the humiliation that they were trying to achieve in, in the treatment of him. And there are wounds and bruises that are a result of the scourging all over his body, front and back. And it's in the pelvic region. And it's all over his chest and torso and his legs and back. The instrument that was used for the scourging is known as the Roman flagrum. And this is a whip that has been discovered in ruins in the Roman excavations. So it was a short leather or a short wooden handle 
with three leather strips coming off of it. And then at the end of those leather strips were barbells that had hooks at the end of them. And the purpose of those hooks was to, to claw the skin and actually rip the skin away from the body. And I think we sometimes overlook or underestimate the severity of the flogging that Jesus received. These uh, Roman legionaries who performed the scourging, they were expert at torture. And the shroud documents that the beating that Jesus endured was very severe and unrestrained. And it probably left him in, in shock because there would have been repeated beating in the chest area that would have started to cause internal hemorrhaging, which had, would have put pressure on his lungs and on his heart and caused the body cavity to start filling up with a bloody fluid. And this scourging that Jesus endured was a, a fulfillment of the prophecy with his stripes, we are healed. So the next thing that we see on the, the shroud is the crown of thorns. And this is one of the most enigmatic items on the shroud, because as I've mentioned several times, there's no one else in recorded history besides Jesus of Nazareth, who was crowned with thorns. And so it tell, the scriptures tell us that after Pilate had Jesus scourged, he turned him over to the Re Roman legionaries. And this was a group of between 300 and 600 Roman soldiers. And they had been brought into Jerusalem to control the crowds during the Passover pilgrimage. So this was a large group of soldiers, and the scriptures tell us in John that the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and put a purple robe on him. And the purpose of this was to mock him and also the torture of having that, that crown of thorns put on his head. Now, we often visualize the crown of thorns as being a nice ring or circlet on the the around the perimeter of Jesus' head. But the reality was that it was a clump of thorns that a Roman legionary with probably leather gloves went out and cut this thorny thistle bush and brought back a clump of these thorns and just smashed it onto Jesus' head. The most pollen that was found on the shroud is from this plant, the Gundelia tornaforti, and there's a lot of pollen in the head region and the shoulder region from this plant, which flowers around Jerusalem in the springtime. <clears throat> For me, the crown of thorns is probably one of the most significant theological aspects of the passion of Jesus. I'm just going to give you a taste of the theology behind the crowning of thorns. If you remember back to the book of Genesis, when Adam and Eve first sinned, the resort, result of their sin was that God cursed the ground so that it will produce thorns and thistles for you. So we see that the wage of sin is death, and Jesus is taking this sin and wearing it on his head, and he's taking that sin with him to the cross. Then the scriptures tell us that Pilate finally gave in to the demands of the crowd, and he turned Jesus over to be crucified. So it says in the scriptures, they took Jesus, therefore, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of the skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha. And I put this slide in here so that you could see that Jesus would have been carrying the cross beam of the, the cross and not the full upright portion in cross beam, which is what we often see in art depicting Jesus carrying his cross. But the reality is that the upright portion of the cross would have stayed in place at the place of execution, and the victim would only be carrying the cross beam. And his hands, his arms would have been outstretched and tied to the wood of the cross. And he most likely was tied to the other two prisoners who were being executed with him. And then they would walk together carrying this heavy burden on their back as they walked the three quarters of a mile or mile outside of the city walls to the place of execution. So the shroud shows us that on top of the scourge marks, there are abrasions on the shoulders. And so it, this indicates that there was a heavy object that was rubbing on top of the scourge marks as Jesus made his way to Calvary. <clears throat> We also see some very wounded knees and 
This is because as Jesus was walking and carrying this heavy crossbeam on his back, our, our, the stations of the cross in our Catholic tradition tell us that Jesus fell for three, three times on the way to Calvary. And so you can imagine with his arms outstretched and with this heavy crossbeam weighing between 70 and 100 pounds on his back, that when he fell, he would have no way to break his fall. So he would fall on his knees and then fall on his chest with this heavy wooden crossbeam crushing down on his back. And the, the knees on the shroud are very badly cut and bruised. And there's also a great deal of that dust that I was telling you about, the dust and dirt in the area of his knees. And this, as I mentioned, this is that travertine aragonite limestone, and it has been found only in the ancient tombs around the area of Jerusalem. So once Jesus made it to Calvary, the Gospels tell us that when they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. So on the shroud, there are three wounds of the crucifixion. There is one wound through the wrist, and the other wrist is covered with the hand, so you can't see it. And then there's two wounds in the feet. And this is something that always startles people when they see that the wounds are in the wrist and not in the palms of the hand, because we're so used to seeing that in how Jesus' crucifixion is depicted in art. And the reason why it's depicted that way is because Constantine outlawed crucifixion in the fourth century. So there wasn't an understanding of how people were crucified. And that's why that Dr. Barbet started crucifying cadavers. And what he discovered is that if he put a nail through the palm of the hand, it, the weight of the body would rip that nail out and it couldn't support the weight of the body. And so what he discovered is that there is a place in the wrist area called the place of death dot. And if you put a nail through the lower part of the palm, it exits at that place of death dot on the, the wrist area of the, of the arm. And the bones in that area will expand to allow the nail to pass through it. And then they will come back together around the nail and they're very secure and it will hold the weight of the body. The other thing that he discovered is that when the nail passes through that place of dust dot, it severs the median nerve. And so it draws the thumbs very strongly into the palms. And there are no thumbs visible on the shroud. I'll just show you this one again. The, the thumbs are not visible on the shroud. The, the forensic doctors who've looked at this have said that this median nerve severing is one of the most painful things that Jesus would have experienced in a crucifixion. And it would have been a constant pain that would have endured. So the feet of, of Jesus were pierced. And there's two schools of thought on this. One school of thought is that there were two nails. So the feet were nailed independently to the cross. And there is another school of thought that one foot was on top of the other foot, and there was one nail utilized through both feet. Whatever the answer to that is, you can be sure that the Roman legionaries were experts in crucifixion. They had crucified thousands of people, and they knew the most efficient way to do it. And their objective was to maximize the amount of torture that the person would endure. So crucifixion was it was the worst possible punishment that you could have. Not only was it extremely painful, but it was humiliating and it also could last for up to two or three days. And then once a person died from crucifixion, they left their body on the cross so that they would be eaten, the body would be eaten by animals. So it was a terrible, terrible fate to be executed in this way. So the mechanism for death when you're crucified is your arms are nailed to the wood of the cross. And so you have to hang with your hands against those nails and passively take air in. But the only way to exhale that air is to press up on your feet and then forcefully exhale the air. 
And so this is what somebody would endure on the cross. They would slump down in exhaustion, passively take air in, and then have to get the strength to push up against those nails to exhale. So the scriptures tell us that Jesus was crucified somewhere between nine and noon on, on that morning, the day of preparation for the, the feast of the Passover. And the, if you study the scriptures, there's the seven last words of Jesus. And one of them that I was just reading about recently is it said that Jesus was saying, forgive them, Lord, they know not what they are doing. And so we're familiar with this, that Jesus was still offering mercy and grace to the people that were crucifying him and causing him all of this pain. But the translation that I read said that Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them. So that means he didn't just say it once. He was saying it over and over and over again. He, even as they were nailing him to the cross, he was saying, Father, forgive them. They know not what they are doing. So the scriptures tell us that from noon three, that darkness came over the land. And so this should remind you of those plagues, that the ninth plague was that darkness that came over the land, a darkness so deep that you could feel it. And that's what Jesus experienced while he was on the cross. And then the scriptures tell us that at the moment of his death, Jesus cried out. And with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. And the gospel of John says, therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. So we see Jesus on the cross, still in control, still honoring his father, and still praying for the people that are around him. But scientists have asked the question, well, if the mechanism for death with crucifixion is asphyxiation, how could Jesus have cried out in a loud voice? And so what they speculate is that because of the severe scourging that Jesus had already endured, the repeated falls where the pressure was building up around his heart and in his chest, that he died quickly, not from asphyxiation, but from the, the fluid building up pressure on his heart, which would have caused a rupture in the wall of his heart and lead to a sudden death. And what that says to me is that Jesus died from a broken heart. So the scriptures tell us that since it was the day of preparation, the Jews didn't want to have the bodies staying on the cross. So they went to Pilate and they asked to, to have the bodies taken down. And this, this is um, not an act of mercy. They didn't want to be defiled by dead bodies. So they, they went to Pilate and they asked for permission to break the legs of the, the crucified. And the reason why they broke the legs was just as I told you, they could no longer push themselves up to exhale. So once their legs were broken by a large mallet or a large club, they, they would break their legs between the, the knees and the ankles. They could no longer push themselves up to breathe and they would die very quickly from asphyxiation. But the scriptures tell us that when they came to Jesus, he was already dead. And this again is the fulfillment of the scripture from Exodus that none of his bones shall be broken. And Pilate indicates that he was surprised that Jesus had died so quickly. And just to make sure that, oh, hello. Oh. <laughs> he was surprised he had died so quickly, yes, because the other men who had been crucified with Jesus were still alive. And so they had their legs broken. So the next uh, event that happened is that the centurion who was standing guard, just to make sure that Jesus was really dead, he pierced his side with a spear. And John's gospel is very clear about this. He said, one of the soldiers thrust a lance into his side and immediately a flow of blood and water came forth. And John really wants us to get this point because he breaks in to his gospel and he says, an eyewitness has testified to this. And he's referring to himself here. And he says, his testimony is true. He knows that what he says is true so that you may also believe. And this is indicated on the shroud, blood and water poured out by the spear wound on the side. 
This was something that was not discovered until the shroud was photographed using ultraviolet spectroscopy. And what they discovered is that the blood from the side wound is very bright red. You can see it with the naked eye. But what they didn't see until they used that technique is that there is a halo of that pleural fluid, that serum that had separated from the red blood cells. And that serum is fluoresces when you look at the shroud with a special filter on. And so this validates exactly what John said, that when Jesus' side was pierced, blood and water did flow out because this was post-mortem blood. And once the part stops pumping, the blood starts to separate and the heavy red blood cells go to the bottom and the serum comes on to the top. This is the, the Roman lancia, which was the spear that was used by the Roman legionaries in that area of Judea. And the wound is an oval shape and the size and shape of it match exactly with Roman lancia. So the Roman centurion who's standing at the foot of the cross is the one who proclaims, surely this man was the son of God. And so what did that centurion see? This is a Gentile man who had been following Jesus through his passion and his suffering. And he's the first one to proclaim that Jesus is the son, the son of God from the foot of the cross. And the gospels, three of the gospels tell us that at the moment that Jesus died, the curtain in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And this is so significant. And it was recorded in three of the gospels because they wanted us to understand that what Jesus had accomplished by dying on the cross was he had fulfilled all of the old covenant. He had made the old temple unnecessary anymore by the sacrifice of his body. So I just want to take a quick minute and tell you a little bit about the features of this veil and why it's so important. This is a, a rendering of the, the tent that was built by Moses in the desert. And there were two parts of the tent, the holy place and the most holy place. And the veil that separated them was uh, beautifully, whoops, beautifully wrought, a beautifully wrought tapestry. So the outside and the most in the holy place, any of the priests could come once a week to offer sacrifices. But the most holy place, only the high priest would enter into the, the most holy place and only one time a year. And that is on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And that's the day that the high priest would go into the most holy place and offer a sacrifice for the sins of the people against God. Now, this most holy place is where the Jewish people believed was the very presence of God. And that is where the Ark of the Covenant was stored. And inside of the Ark of the Covenant was the manna from the desert, the staff of Aaron that bloomed in front of Pharaoh, and the Ten Commandments. So in the, the tent of meeting in Moses' time, the Ark of the Covenant was there. But by the time the temple had been built in Jerusalem, this is a rendering of the temple in Jerusalem. This is the most holy place. And by the time that temple had been built, the Ark of the Covenant was lost. So even though there was the holy place and the most holy place with the veil in between, there was no presence of God in that most holy place but the high priest still performed this ritual every year on Yom Kippur. And in Leviticus, it says that in order to go behind the veil, the high priest had to dress in a pure linen cloth. And so we see at the moment that Jesus dies, this curtain, which was no small flimsy veil, it was a very large tapestry that was the width of the, of the palm of a man's hand, and it took 300 priests to move it. It was that heavy, and it was ripped from top to bottom. So this is clearly a supernatural event that happened at the moment of Jesus' death. So the message for us is that Jesus opened a way through his flesh. This is what Hebrews tells us, that Jesus opened the way as the great high priest and he offered one perfect sacrifice for all people for all time. So the Gospels tell us that a rich man named Joseph of Arimathea 
went to Pilate and asked for permission to take Jesus' body. And he wrapped that body in a pure, a ritually pure linen cloth. And it was a fine, expensive linen cloth. And then he took that body and he buried it in his own grave. So we see that Jesus was wrapped in fine linen like a, um, like a priest. And then he was put into a new grave and buried like a king. So we see the offices of Jesus even being fulfilled in his death. So we know that uh, Jesus didn't stay in that tomb, but he was there on Holy Saturday. And I just like to mention this because Jesus was so obedient that he still followed the rules. And on the Sabbath day, he rested. And it wasn't until the eighth day, the new first day of the week, that Jesus was resurrected. And the, the shroud tells us that Jesus' body did not undergo any kind of decay. There's no decomposition. There's no putrefaction on the shroud. And when a body starts to decay, ammonia gas is released from the mouth and from the nose. And there's no indication of that on the shroud. So we see in this face of Jesus, this is the man who is dead. And he suffered this horrendous torture. And yet we see such a look of peace and serenity on his face. And we can see what Pope St. John Paul II said, that this is an image of God's love as well as of human sin. So we know this isn't the end of the story, that on Easter morning that Jesus left that linen cloth behind and he was resurrected from the dead. And this is an aspect of our faith. This is what our faith teaches us. And I want to end with, the words of Pope St. John Paul II, because I really loved what he said in understanding the shroud, that it invites us to rediscover the ultimate reason for Jesus' redeeming love. In the incomparable suffering that it documents, the love of the one who so loved the world that he gave his only son, it's made almost tangible and reveals its astonishing dimensions. In its presence, Believers can only exclaim in all truth, Lord, you could not love me more. So thank you all. I left a lot of time here for two things. First of all, we have uh, Genevieve Keeney here with us. And Genevieve is the president and CEO and also the curator of the National Museum of Funeral History. And so you received some handouts when you came in. And so Genevieve is gonna come up and talk to us about her museum and the exhibit that we have planned. And then when Genevieve is finished, I'm available for questions. So uh, please don't run off and I'd love to, to take your questions. So thank you all for being here. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. And um, we're really excited to share our venture that we have been on since 2019. Um, so I, I run the National Museum of Funeral History, and I have been doing that now for going on 16 years here in Houston. Uh, the museum is celebrating its 30th year, believe it or not, if you don't know, we have been here that long in, in this fine city. Um, but how did the Shroud of Turin come to the National Museum of Funeral History. And of course, it's not the original because that will forever stay in Turin, uh, but it is a, a certified copy that we are going to be receiving. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about our journey and the significance of having the shroud at our museum. We, uh, one day I walked into the museum where you know, all of the exhibits are. And by this time I'm the president and the COO and I'm mainly doing the administrative work of the museum. Because at that time I had curated a lot of the exhibits and the, my work was done. And so to go into the museum was a rare occurrence for me. And I have fabulous docents now that do the touring of the visitors, which I also used to do in the beginning. And so my, my, my need for going into the museum was just so rare in these moments. 
And I still to this day cannot tell you why I went into the museum that morning, but I did. I was walking through there, I guess somewhat aimlessly, and we had this crossroad, if you will, where two walkways meet. And I ran into Father Jared, and he was giving a tour uh, at the museum, focusing mainly on our Pope exhibit, which goes into the celebrating the lives and death of the Pope, going all the way back to St. Peter. And I said, well, how did you enjoy the Pope exhibit? He said, it was fabulous. He said, I have a question. You ever thought of bringing the Shroud of Turin here? And I said, Shroud of Turin? Somewhere back in my mind, I was thinking, I've heard that, but I'm not really sure if I'm recalling what I think he's talking about. So I said, I said, no, but please let's talk more. I ran back in my office and I looked up the Shroud of Turin. And I was like, ooh, that's a burial cloth. Well, okay, I see some significance here. Uh, it, it's, it's the burial cloth that they believe to be that in which wrapped Jesus in the tomb. Well, yeah, I think let's talk more. So then I met Nora because Nora and Father Jared were both taking a course together that was in Rome. And they were the only two students here in Houston taking it distantly uh, on distance education. So I met with them. And then before you know it, we began the work of the Shroud of Turin. But how did that work begin? Well, we had our sites on a certified copy. There's a lot of copies out there that you can obtain on Amazon, eBay, <laughs> but not for the National Museum of Funeral History. That will not do. And I said, we need a certified copy. So we went to Cardinal DiNardo, who supported us in 2006 when we began the work on the Pope exhibit. He was a bishop at the time. We went to him and said, we want to showcase this exhibit and talk about the burial practices of the popes. We think it's fascinating. We worked hard with the Vatican after he wrote a letter on our behalf endorsing the exhibit. We went from a 10 by 10 square foot exhibit to a 5,000 square foot exhibit. We went from drinking from a garden hose from a fire hose overnight when the Vatican opened their archives. And it was a great success. So we went back to Cardinal Donardo and said, can you endorse the Shroud of Turin exhibit at our museum? And he said, most certainly he signed the letter. We sent it off uh, to Turin, to the bishop. And that was in 2019. We did hear back and they said that they would oblige a certified copy for us. Uh, and then we heard nothing. So we continued to do our, our work in delivering the message of the Shroud of Turin coming to Houston, all while we were just secretly hoping that we were still going to get our certified copy. And we were a week away from having um, our presentations and kicking off our capital campaign and COVID struck. And of course, all momentum was lost. But on that Easter Sunday, the Shroud of Turin came out and it was televised a viewing and the shroud only comes out four times in a century and because we were in a moment of a pandemic the pope felt it necessary to bring it out because we no longer could gather for our easter services as we normally would and so it was to help give people the faith to endure what we were all suffering worldwide and so we continued behind the scenes working keeping holding on to our faith and hope that we could still bring this exhibit to Houston. So fast forward, we're still trying to contact the people in Turin. Father Jared had moved on. He got another assignment is no longer in Houston. And Nora continued to call me. We've been working on trying to obtain some other artifacts to enhance the exhibit that has come and gone. Uh, it's been quite a journey. And last week we received a letter from the from the staff of the Bishop of Turin, apologizing for the delay. But not only did we get that letter of apology, we've learned some amazing things. One, they're gonna gift it to us. We are gonna be gifted a certified copy of the Shroud of Turin to house here in our great city. Secondly, <laughs> Secondly, we learned that in 2020, they removed some flax seeds uh, uh, from the vaults. And these seeds were planted in 2020 near Bergen, 
Bergamo, Bergamo, Italy. They were grown organically and they were harvested in a way using the ancient methods. And they were then woven on a manufactured loom from that time period. And they have now been used to create the linen of the cloth that we are receiving that has a high definition image that is now printed upon it. So how do we got our shroud in 2019? It wouldn't have been, you know, so authentic. And because we, because we had the pandemic, because we had these wait, this waiting period, um, we are now blessed with something greater. And so it just goes to show, have faith, keep hope, because when one door closes, a better one will open. So we are hoping to have our exhibit showcasing in April of 2023, if all continues to go well. <laughs> um, so um, thank you all. Um, we've given you a handout on that handout. Um, we have a QR code that'll help if, if anyone wants to take part in this and provide donations uh, to the exhibition. All donations will go to the manufacturing of the exhibit. Any, uh, any monies left over, we plan on creating a grant uh, for the seminaries uh, who have um, uh, like the, the young, the youth coming up in the seminary schools where they can apply for a grant to be able to bring the students uh, to see this fabulous exhibit. And um, so we hope to be able to continue uh, contributing to that grant throughout the years. Um, and then uh, Father Dalton, who was supposed to be coming from Italy in uh, March of 2020, which we all know didn't happen now. Um, he's able to bless us with his presence in September 9th through the 11th, where he will also be talking on the shroud. He'll also be giving uh, one of the um, presentations in Spanish. Uh, and so we're really excited about that. And Nora's also returning in June, where we will also do a um, a, a large group of some more of these presentations to really help everyone see the amazing work that we're doing and the amazing shroud that we're getting here in Houston. And we are the first non ecclesiastical and never say that word, <laughs> ecclesiastic body that the Bishop of Turin has authorized to hang the shroud of Turin in. So we are truly blessed. And it's very, very, um, applicable to our museum because it is the most famous burial of all time. And we will be focusing on the burial of the man in the shroud and the burial cloth that he was placed in and the customs and traditions behind his burial. So we hope to move you guys and make you feel immersed in his tomb. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I'm, I'm very happy to take any questions. Um, I left a lot of time for questions. Yes. I'm so glad you asked that. <laughs> well, this is the ongoing study to understand the, the mechanism for image formation. There are theories that are out there and they are so beyond my scientific understanding, but I can tell you that they involve radiation and low heat uh, light and very, very short duration, like one fortieth of a second. So a light that is bright enough and intense enough so that it would leave the image, but that would not uh, consume the fabric. And there, a, new, a theory that's out there is that when the body became spiritual, it became mechanically transparent, is the term that they used, and it created a vacuum. And so when the, the vacuum was created, the cloth collapsed in. And so that's why the density of the image is the same on the front and on the back, because there wasn't the pressure of the body on it at the time that the image was made. And the... There's ongoing research about this, and what they have discovered with the experiments that they're doing is that that could account for the radiocarbon dating anomaly, because there would have been uh, more C14 atoms in the fabric as a result of this event that happened. The, this 
This explanation explains a lot of the anomalies or the mysteries of the shroud. I'm sorry, I'm not a good scientist for explaining that better, but there are some really good books out there that I can recommend. <coughs> yes. Mostly for its protection to keep it from aging when it's um, displayed in light and it's an old fabric and it's, it's not as fragile as you would think after being 2000 years old, but it's for its protection. Father Vince. Mm. Mm. There is DNA all over the shroud because it's been handled over the centuries. And they have taken some DNA, um, I believe it was from the back of the blood stain at the back of the head, and they have been able to sequence it, but it's very degraded. So there's not enough of the DNA sequence to like clone Jesus, but <laughs> they have been able to, to learn information about the, the blood type. And, but there's not, there's DNA from all the people who have handled it over the centuries. Yes. Oh, another one of my favorite questions. <laughs> I'm so glad you asked that. Yes. So I was trying to make sure I left enough time, so I skipped this slide. But the face cloth, you might have remembered from the scriptures that we started with in John chapter 20, it talks about the napkin that had covered his face and was folded up and was separate from the linen cloth. And so this was the sudarium of Oviedo. And sudarium is a word for handkerchief. And this is also a linen cloth, but it's not the finely woven linen cloth like the, the shroud. But you can see in this, image right here that they put the, the napkin on the face of the deceased. And that was to protect the family from seeing his, the condition his face was in because he would have had blood flowing out of his nose and his mouth and, and he was bruised and battered. And so before they took him down from the cross, they wrapped this napkin around his face. And then that stayed on his face until he went to the place where he was wrapped in the shroud. And the Sudarium of Oviedo, it's in Oviedo, Spain. It's been there since 611. So the provenance of that cloth is well known since that time. And it's been extensively studied as well. It has no image on it, but it has the blood stains and the pleural fluid, and it has the pollen and the dust that match exactly on the, the shroud. And the blood stain patterns also match the, the puncture wounds from the crown of thorns that are evident on the shroud. And so scientists have concluded that the two cloths covered the same face within a very short time of each other. So thank you for asking that. I saw another question. Father Vince. <laughs> yes, that's true. The sculpture, is that the, what, what you're referring to? This is a sculpture, it's an artist, I believe her name is Isabel Pixack, and she used the shroud as the model for how she um, designed the body. And that's, it shows that the body was in rigor mortis and that the knees were bent and that when the body was taken down from the cross, they probably had to break the rigor and then actually bind the hands together to keep them together in the tomb. And that's another explanation for the linen strips. And then also on the, around the face, you can see that there was a chin strap that went around the face. And the, the purpose of that was to keep the jaw closed in death. So there were multiple claws that were in the tomb in addition to the face cloth and the shroud. And then there were the, the linen strips that were used to, to bind the body and also potentially to bind the shroud to the body. But this is a, a sculpture that was designed based on her understanding of what the shroud showed. Yes. Oh. The one in, in Turin or the, oh, yes, great. Thank you. Yeah, it's fabulous. Question here? Yes. There were 
that's a different cloth. So there was the napkin put on his face on the cross. And then there's also a chin strap that's evident where the, the hair is kind of coming forward around the chin cloth. Uh, and that was for the purpose of keeping the jaw closed. So in the Jewish burial customs, any post-mortem blood or body fluid needed to be buried with the body. So after they took the face cloth off, they would have kept it with the body. So it wasn't on his face and it has no image on it, but it was buried in the tomb with the body because they, they believed in a bodily resurrection and they had to have all the pieces there for the bodily resurrection. So any post-mortem blood had to be collected and kept with the body. That's recorded in the Gospel of Luke, and that's a medical condition known as hematidrosis. And it's when somebody is in so much anguish or so under so much stress that the blood vessels under their skin burst and the blood cells squeeze through the sweat glands and then it looks like a bloody sweat. And one of the consequences of that is not only the bloody sweat, but it leaves the skin so sensitive that even a light breeze or a kiss of peace like Jesus received from Judas would have been extremely painful. And that is actually the beginning of, of Jesus' passion is that hematidrosis, that intense agony that he, he experienced in the garden. So thank you for bringing that up. The word excruciating comes from out of the cross. And it, it was a new word that was invented to describe the ultimate pain of being crucified. It's the most excruciating experience that someone could endure. It, mm -hmm. Oh, he was a believer and he believed in the authenticity of the shroud. And so when he gave his lectures, they were usually in churches and he talked about the, the suffering of Jesus. So he, he was one of the scientists from the Catholic background who went over there, but there was a wide variety of backgrounds from the, the researchers on the STIRP team. Oh, well, right. So the scourging was not intended to kill Jesus. And it was the job of the Roman centurion to make sure that he wasn't killed in a scourging and that he didn't die on the road. And that, that's part of the reason why we have the scriptures that Simon of Cyrene was, was forced to help Jesus carry his cross because they were afraid he was so far exhausted and in shock and dehydrated that he wasn't going to actually make it all the way to Calvary for his crucifixion. So we have the, this image of Simon of Cyrene being the ultimate disciple, taking up his cross and following Jesus. Yeah, it was a severe beating. Any other questions? Yes. Okay, one here and then one there. Go ahead. There's multiple books written about, did Jesus have a complete burial or did he not have a complete burial? Because the scriptures tell us that Joseph of Arimathea or Nicodemus brought a hundred pounds of ointments to uh, anoint the body. But yet we have this uh, sense that the women that were coming on the Sunday morning, on Easter morning, that they were coming to finish the process. So there's multiple ideas about whether Jesus had a complete burial or not. So one of the, like in the Jewish customs, the, the women would have been responsible for cutting the fingernails and cleaning the beard and shaping the hair and washing the body. But in a death of somebody who had been murdered or uh, executed, those rituals were not allowed. So there's some, it's not clear if he had a completed burial and if he had all of those, um, those ointments performed or not. So I read both, both sides. So I'm sorry, I can't answer that more definitively. I saw a question up here. Well, that was the question about, well, how is that image formed? 
And so if it was a, a light that was bright enough to cause potentially a sonic boom to move that stone away and to leave behind this image that there's no other image like it in the world, that there was some kind of an event that happened at the moment of resurrection. And that is when this image was created. That is a matter of faith, I believe. Although if you're familiar with Father Spitzer, he's, he's starting to sound very convinced that science has proved that the image was created by a resurrection event. But I believe that's a matter of faith that we will, and our faith is a gift to us. And science and, and faith work together and they support each other, but there's some element of mystery that we are given the grace of having faith to accept that what Jesus said and what the scriptures record is true. Oh, okay. So you're asking about if there's another clock or if it's this clock. Okay. Right. So in the tradition of the Stations of the Cross, one of the stations is Veronica wipes the face of Jesus and then leaves behind this image. And so that's called Veronica's veil. Veronica is Vera icon, a true image. And so that name has kind of grown over the years. There are some claws that are have claim to be Veronica's veil and they're only face images. I haven't really studied those in any depth, so I, I don't really know that much about them, but there, there is a tradition in the church that there were other claws that have a face image, but nothing else with a full body front and back image. Yes. No, it's a program. It's an online program. It's open to anyone. It's a, a post-baccalaureate certification in Shroud Studies, and it's six semester-long courses in the Shroud. And it's available through the uh, Regina Apostolorum, the Pontifical Athenaeum Regina Apostolorum, which is in Rome, Italy. But it's available online, and it's absolutely fabulous. If you are Shroud lovers, you've, you've heard of Barry Schwartz. Barry is one of the instructors for the class, and he talks about STIRP in great deal of detail. Uh, Father Dalton, who we're having come in September, he teaches the pastoral implications of the shroud and goes into great depth on all of the, the wounds of Christ and the theological meaning of all of them. I just gave you a very tip of the iceberg taste of that. So it's just an absolutely wonderful in-depth course on shroud studies. And I think what that illustrates is that there's so much information available on the shroud. There's so many disciplines that are looking at the shroud from multiple viewpoints that you can never stop learning about it. Well, I'm hoping that's what I'm accomplishing by giving these presentations. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I, I saw a question here. Oh. My other favorite question, thank you for asking that. Yes, there are theories that are starting to be very well uh, agreed upon. And so the journey of the shroud, let me back up. The journey of the shroud before it showed up in France is starting to become more and more clear. And part of the reason there's a lot of scholarship being done on this right now. And so they're looking at not only recorded correspondence, like things written down. They're looking at things like art documents. They're looking at coins that were minted like in the seventh century that show images that are clearly the man of the shroud. Okay, I gotta keep going. Okay, there we go. So the journey of the shroud starts in Jerusalem at the crucifixion and death of Jesus. And then there is a legend in the church that the disciple Jude Thaddeus took the shroud to this area of Edessa, which is modern day Urfa, Turkey. And this is the area that was one of the first complete areas that became Christianized in the whole world. And the legend is that King Abgar 
wrote a letter asking Jesus to come to him because he had leprosy and he wanted to be healed. Well, Jesus didn't go, but the legend has it that he sent his apostle Jude Thaddeus with the the shroud. Now, I'm really emphasizing that that's a legend because there's it's an oral tradition, but there's not a lot of evidence about that. However, there is evidence that the shroud was in Edessa and that during a period of its life there, it was hidden away either for safekeeping or for um, protection, but it was put in a gate, above a gate in one of the city walls, and it was forgotten. And so it wasn't found again until there was an earthquake and the the gate was demolished and the shroud was revealed. Now, the reason why historians think that's what happened is because before that time period, the images of Jesus in art were of a young man looking left, looking right, clean shaven, short hair, looking like a Roman god. Or he was um, depicted just symbolically like a fish or a lamb. So after the period of time of this earthquake, everybody started having a depiction of Jesus is the one we recognize today. Straightforward looking, long nose, almond shaped eyes, hair parted in the middle, that very um, clear image of that backwards E blood stain on his forehead, that became the image of Jesus that was universally recognized. And so art historians say that there had to have been a model for that, that something had to have happened for this image to have all of a sudden have been propagated across the world with the understanding of this is what Jesus looked like. So it's believed that the shroud was in that city of Edessa and it eventually uh, fell to the Muslims. And so the in 944, I think it was, the king in, in Byzantium, he had heard that they had this cloth, this cloth of Edessa that had this figure of Jesus on it. And so he wanted it. And so he took his army from Constantinople or Byzantium and traveled to Turkey, to Edessa, and he surrounded the city with his army. And he brought with him a lot of prisoners of war. I can't remember the exact number now. And he exchanged those prisoners of war for this Edessa cloth. And he took that cloth back, back with him to Constantinople. So it was in Constantinople, this Edessa cloth. Of course, it wasn't called the Shroud of Turin. But there's people are looking at inventories of what were in the churches. And I also should mention they're looking at liturgical practices, especially in the Eastern Church, that there were rituals in the Eastern Church of things that were done on Holy Saturday, for example, where they... They represented the shroud and the wounds of Jesus on a cloth. And then also the way the altar cloth was, the instructions in the Eastern church were a long linen cloth showing the wounds of the body of Jesus. That was what was on the, the altar. And this was, I believe this started in the fourth century. So very early on. So um, it's believed that the cloth moved to Constantinople or Byzantium in the 900s. And then it was venerated there by the people regularly. And there are letters that were written talking about this Edessa cloth or this cloth with the, the image of a cru crucified man that was venerated in Constantinople. Well, in 1204, during the Fourth Crusade, the French crusaders came and they ransacked Constantinople. And this is one of the darkest points in Christian history where Christians went into the city and they, they raided and pillaged and destroyed this city that was their sister Christian city. And they stole their artifacts and they stole them and took them back to Europe. And so remember I said, this family that was displaying the shroud wouldn't say where how they had come to own it. And the reason why is because Pope Innocent III said that anybody who had participated in this pillaging of this Christian city was under threat of excommunication. And so nobody would admit that they had a relic such as that. So there's 140 years or so that's kind of lost, but there's active scholarship being done on that right now. They're looking in the Vatican archives, they're looking in um, manuscripts, medieval manuscripts, to try to understand the history during those, those years that aren't accounted for. 
slides, but they're starting to get a pretty good picture of the journey. Um, and that's kind of just the highlights of it. Well, thank you all so much for being here. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Raymond. Thank you.